Uh, so first, thanks to Guillaume for inviting me to come speak here. And today I'll be talking about some joint work with uh, Guillaume as well as uh, Parmeet Kassal and Shin, who's virtually in the audience via Zoom. Uh, <laughs> so generally speaking, I'm going to talk about the relationship between Lovell CFT and conformal blocks. And so first I'll tell you guys about both of those things and then explain how to construct conformal blocks on the sphere via uh, GFF and Lovell CFT related construction, talk through the ideas that go into our proof of this, and then finally talk about the analogs for the torts. So first off, uh, just as a brief introduction, uh, 2B conformal field theory is a study of certain random fields on Riemann surfaces whose law should transform covariantly under conformal mappings between such surfaces. And this originated in this um, seminal paper of Polykov in 1981 uh, in the context of string theory. And it was very quickly generalized into a more axiomatic uh, conformal bootstrap framework by Belvi and Polykov and Zamolodchkov uh, in 1984. So more concretely, to specify a conformal field theory, we need to specify certain random fields on any Riemann surface, uh, which are studied via certain endpoint correlation functions, uh, which depend on some weights alpha i and points ci on that Riemann surface. And the constraints of conformal symmetry imply certain identities that must be satisfied by these conformal blocks. Um, now, the original motivation from string theory gives these endpoint functions certain meaning as formal path integrals over these random fields, but it's actually somewhat difficult to make this rigorous. Now, the conformal bootstrap framework allows us to take certain gluings of punctured surfaces um, and obtain a recursive relation for, um, for correlation functions on the glued surfaces from more primitive objects associated to the original surfaces we glued together. Uh, so the most basic form of this is a gluing of two three-punctured spheres to form a single four-punctured sphere. And in the conformal bootstrap framework, this corresponds to the following identity. So on the left-hand side, we have the four-point function on a sphere corresponding to a sphere with punctures at the points zi and weights alpha i at each puncture. Uh, on the right-hand side, we have an integral over a space of states of our conformal field theory, where the function C is the three-point function um, along which uh, three-point function associated to each thrice-punctured sphere. And we have new objects, F, which are conformal blocks and go into the relation between the four-point function and pairs of three-point functions. Uh, so the focus of this talk is gonna be these objects, F, which are called the conformal blocks. Now, to specify a conformal bootstrap, we have to narrow down to a specific conformal field theory. So in this case, we're going to choose Louisville theory, which depends on certain parameters. Uh, one is uh, the coupling constant gamma in 0, 2. And that leads to the value of the central charge with the, uh, the identity shown. In this case, the parameterization of gamma between 0 and 2 leads to central charges, which are greater than 25. So Louisville theory is some conformal field theory corresponding to some representation of a tensor product of the Vera Sor algebra with itself, given by the integral, the direct integral over this spectrum, which we index by P. And this is associated with certain conformal dimension, which we'll call delta, which is Q squared plus P squared over four. So if we plug this formalism into the conformal bootstrap from the previous slide, uh, we're going to get Louisville theory. Now, the original definition of CFT by Polykov was, uh, was constructed to study certain random surfaces. Now, it turns out that the formal path integral interpretation of this uh, cannot be really made rigorous as a model of, as an actual um, probability space over random surfaces, but there is a probabilistic construction of Louisville CFT using a expectation over the GFF as well as an integration over the zero mode, uh, which leads to some type of random field um, on surfaces. So this has been worked out in a number of papers over the last 10 years or so, 
uh, by the authors listed, first for the sphere and then generalized to other types of surfaces and surfaces with boundary. And roughly speaking, what this does is interpret the formal path integral um, over a random mapping X on the surface uh, to an expectation over a GFF on this surface, uh, again, with this integral over the zero modes. So to be a little bit more concrete, if we take Blueville theory on the Riemann sphere, then for some punctures at points zi and weights alpha i, then we can define the endpoint function of Blueville theory on the sphere as this integral, again, over the zero mode C of this expectation over a formal exponential of the GFF evaluated at the points zi with weights alpha i. And we have to add in this, um, this exponential of A of C, which gives the background metric associating the factification of the complex numbers into this Riemann sphere. So all this is to say that there is some probabilistic construction which allows us to define the endpoint functions of Louisville theory in terms of the GF. Now, in the last couple of years, um, as you guys probably know, there's been a lot of progress in the conformal bootstrap for Louisville theory on the sphere. So first in 2017, the three-point functions of Louisville theory were computed rigorously by Kupian and Rhodes and Vargas uh, to be given by the physical prediction of the DOZZ formula. So this is certain explicit formula involving certain double gamma functions. And more recently, uh, the actual conformal bootstrap was proven rigorously uh, by the same group of authors, uh, along with Pierre Lameau, um, which establishes the conformal bootstrap equation shown here for the sphere. And in even more recent work, the same authors have been able to push their techniques to the higher genus story, including the torus. Okay, so the goal of this talk is going to be to study the function um, f sub alpha i of z and p, which is the four point conformal block on the sphere. And what we're going to do is associate two definitions for it coming from the Virasor algebra, as well as the Gaussian free field. Now this object appears both in these two contexts, as well as has relations to many other areas of mathematics and mathematical physics shown in this diagram. So let me now get a little bit more concrete. So first, Let's define this object using the Virasor algebra. So this is an algebra um, generated by generators Ln with a certain the relation at the top of the screen. And we can create a basis for the Virasor algebra using these generators and thereby define a positive to definite Shapovalov form on it. Um, so from the theory of the Virasor algebra, we know that this form is invertible when um, this uh, when this quantity delta stays away from a certain discrete set. Okay, so we have a algebra, the Virasor algebra, with a certain positive definite form on it, as, and we can explicitly compute its determinant. Okay, so to define the conformal block formally from the Virasor algebra, we're going to write it as a formal power series in our uh, variable z. And the coefficients of this formal power series, beta sub n, will be defined in the following way. We have a summation over pairs of Young diagrams, which index a basis of the Virasor algebra. So this will be denoted nu and nu prime. And for each pair of, uh, of Young diagrams, we're going to take the inverse of the graded pieces of the Shapovalov form and sum that over some certain products associated to this Young diagram. Uh, so this is a bit of a arcane explicit definition for the conformal blocks coming from the Virasor algebra. It has another interpretation as some sort of formal matrix element of an intertwiner between certain Virasor algebra representations. Uh, but at least at a very formal level, we define the conformal block as the result of this formal power series coming from representations of the Virasor algebra and certain inner products on the, those representations. 
Okay, so the goal of this talk is to give a way to construct the control block in a slightly more intuitive way coming from the GFF construction of Louisville theory. So let me give a few more details about the GFF. So we have, we're gonna take a log correlated Gaussian field H on the real line with this certain explicit covariance. And so because of this log correlation, actually the variance of the, the field is infinite and we must treat it in the space of distributions. That means that whenever we want to integrate against it, we're gonna take a certain cutoff approximation um, at scale epsilon and eventually take the scale to zero. Okay, so we can view this Gaussian field as the restriction to the real line of the GFF on the upper half plane. Um, and there's a way to associate that to the restriction of the GFF from the sphere. Okay, so using this, we can define our key object, which is the Gaussian multiplicative chaos um, on the real line. Um, so this is supposed to be defined formally as the exponential of the Gaussian free field. Uh, but due to certain convergence issues, we have to renormalize this with the epsilon smoothing of the Gaussian free field. So what that means is that for every smoothing of the GFF H sub epsilon, we renormalize the measure by this, by its expectation, and we find this final renormalized measure at each uh, smoothing epsilon. Um, so the key result is that with this renormalization, we can take the integral of any test function against the epsilon regularized GMC. And as we take epsilon to zero, we obtain the, uh, the integral of a test function against our random measure, which is now denoted the GMC. Okay, so for the rest of the talk, whenever we write this exponential of the Gaussian free field, we're gonna implicitly assume that we applied this regularization procedure. Okay, so now I'm ready to state sort of this, a certain probabilistic object in terms of the GMC, which we'll later see is related to the spherical conformal block. Okay, so this will rely on um, two integrals against the GMC of different quantities. So those are um, encoded in the notation at the top, and let me unpack that a little bit. So first we're gonna consider a variable z in zero one, and we're gonna take the integral of the GMC uh, between zero and z against the certain um, observable which is comprised of the terms added to H to form H hat. So this is a certain product of powers of X, X minus Z and X minus one. Um, so we take the integral of this from zero to Z as well as from one to infinity. And our construction of the probabilistic spherical conformal block and a certain range of parameters is gonna be certain, simply the mixed moments of these two path integrals against the GMC. Okay, so to situate um, the parameters here, we have the four weights alpha one through alpha four, and they're sort of associated to these two integrals um, in two ways. First, the alphas, the weights appear in, in the position of all of the, uh, sorry, in the exponents, of all of these observables, x, x minus z, and x minus one. And they also appear as the moments, uh, moment quantities um, in the exponents of each path integral um, in, inside the expectation. Okay, so we have a certain mixed moment of path integrals against the GMC. And that is the quantity which we'll later see is equal to the spherical control block. Okay, so our main result is the following, which is that in a certain range of parameters, we can characterize the conformal block, which was initially defined as a formal power series via this combinatorial construction coming from the Virasor algebra. Uh, we can characterize it fully analytically in terms of this GMC expression. So what we can say is that 
this spherical conformal block is jointly analytic in this variable Z, which is the cross ratio of all of the insertion points and meromorphic in the variable P, which index the spectrum of Louisville theory. Uh, secondly, we can characterize the whole structure in P in a fully explicit way. Namely, we can show explicitly where all poles lie and what the residues of the conformal block at, at each of those poles is. And they're given by this formula, which is sort of what is predicted by Zomolodzikov's recursion in physics. And finally, we can show that this uh, formal power series actually coincides with the GMC expression that I showed on the previous slide in the cases where the parameters coincide. So you may recall that for the GMC expression, we are requiring that this variable Z be a real number in zero one, whereas the conformal block um, could be defined for all values of this cross ratio in the unit disk. Um, so in particular, I want to emphasize that this shows that the formal power series defining the conformal block actually converges on the entire disk. So another uh, result which we, which is associated with this one, is that we can prove rigorously the fusion transformation on the conformal block. So there's so to be explicit, that shows that we can represent the conformal block um, at Z as an integral of a certain fusion kernel, which is denoted by M here, against the conformal block um, at one minus Z uh, with a certain sort of Gaussian type weight against one minus Z. Uh, so here the fusion kernel has an explicit contour integral formula, which is predicted um, in physical papers. And there's sort of two ways to interpret this fusion transformation. Uh, first, you can view this as the monodromy of the space of spherical conformal blocks between their expansion at z equals zero and their expansion at z equals one. So here on the left-hand side, uh, these are blocks which converge in the unit disk around zero. And on the right-hand side, these are blocks which converge at the unit disk around one. And so in some sense, this fusion transformation is expressing a change of basis between these two spaces. Um, in, the, in a physical way to say this, um, on one side of this expression, we have so-called S-channel blocks, and on the other side, we have so-called T-channel blocks. And so, and another way to interpret the fusion transform is a transformation between S and T-channel spherical blocks. So this results, the statement of this result is not new to our work. It was actually conjectured in papers on Pogso and Teschner from 1999, uh, but we believe we have the first rigorous proof of this statement. Okay, to give a bit more detail on the fusion kernel, which may be useful uh, when we discuss some ideas in the proof later, uh, it's actually just a fully explicit contournal world expression. And the quantities which go into it are certain special functions known as the double gamma function and the double sine function. So without going into too much detail, double gamma function is a certain generalization of the gamma function, uh, which has a two-dimensional grid of simple poles um, at regular intervals on this two-dimensional lattice. Um, so this, this is a generalization of the fact that the ordinary gamma function has a one-dimensional grid of poles on a certain lattice. And the double sine function is simply a ratio of these double gamma functions. So if you look at the definition of the fusion kernel, it's simply a contour integral of certain ratios of double sine functions associated to the parameters entering uh, the uh, entering the kernel. So here the arguments ui, vi, si, and ti are certain linear combinations of the parameters of the fusion kernel. Uh, I've simplified the formula a little bit to spare you the really massive formula. That's the actual definition. Okay, so I'm now going to talk a little bit about how we can come to this type of statement, and this will illustrate the relation with Louisville conformal field theory. So the idea is that we want to actually consider 
boundary Lubel conformal field theory. And that will give rise to a relation between correlation functions of boundary Lubel conformal field theory and, and uh, conformal blocks. Okay, so in the context of Lubel theory, um, I sort of suppress the dependence on these coupling constants. Now, boundary Lubel theory is something that's very analogous to standard Lubel theory, but when we define the correlation functions, we have to, in addition, add certain coupling constants on the boundary of the surface we're considering. So there is an analogous construction uh, from probability of uh, boundary Lubel theory, which takes into account this uh, boundary comp cosmological constant function, which we'll call mu sub b. So if, at the level of probability, we can simply construct certain observables of the GFF on the upper half plane, which are given as the integral over these zero modes C of an expectation against the GFF uh, shown in the big expectation on the right. Um, so you can see it looks very similar to the construction of correlation functions of standard Louisville CFT. The only difference is that in this observable at the very end, we add in these boundary cosmological constants, mu i. Now, there are also um, bootstrap formulas for the Louisville boundary bootstrap, uh, which have been proved in very recent work of Jeremo, Rhodes, Vargas, and Wu. And there are two types of these formulas corresponding to different ways of gluing together surfaces with boundary um, to each other. Um, now, the consequence of this, which these formulas are a little bit complicated, so um, the consequence of this is that unlike these ordinary conformal bootstrap, where two different conformal blocks appeared on the right-hand side, in the boundary bootstrap, we obtain a correlation function of boundary Louisville theory on the left via an integral of only a single conformal block on the right. So here in, in both equations, we have, a we have a boundary correlation function on the left, a conformal block, which is an ordinary conformal block on the right. And then further in the integrand, we have two different boundary three-point functions. Okay, so this, these two uh, bootstrap statements correspond to gluing together three point Sorry, surfaces with uh, three, three punctured surfaces with boundary to create four punctured surfaces with boundary on the left. Okay, so whereas in the ordinary bootstrap, we had two forms of conformal blocks, and therefore it might have, you might think it's somewhat difficult to extract information about a single conformal block from the ordinary bootstrap. In the boundary bootstrap, what we realized is that because the uh, the conformal block only appears once on the right-hand side, we might be able to extract some information about it from these boundary bootstrap type statements. So that's exactly how our, our methodology proceeds. So we're going to take particular values of these boundary coupling constants, and then we're going to apply an integral transform over one of them to the Louisville boundary bootstrap statements. Um, and uh, if you see on the previous slide, there are three distinct quantities here. So on the left-hand side, I have the four-point function of boundary Louisville theory. And on the right-hand side, this boundary bootstrap implies sort of two different formulas for this as an integral over conformal blocks. In the first, we have the conformal block around z equals zero. And in the second, we have the conformal block around z equals one. So our method is going to give sort of three different formulas for this integral transform of the boundary four-point function. Um, so if we directly apply the integral transform to the initial boundary four-point function, which is defined as an expectation against uh, GFF, um, what we'll obtain is exactly a, the GMC formula for the spherical conformal block that I showed a couple slides ago. Okay, so that's sort of a direct transformation on GM, the GMC formula, which was used to construct the boundary Louisville theory. 
Now, if we apply this transformation to the first integral on the right-hand side of the boundary bootstrap, um, we set the parameters up so that it exactly extracts the conformal block, which appears in this unit. Okay, so once you go through all of the computation here, this, this will show the GMC expression for the spherical conformal block. Okay, so in this way, we, we sort of see that, that the boundary bootstrap directly implies that GMC not only represents a, a boundary correlation function, but also just the block which enters into the bootstrap relating to that correlation function. Okay, but still, once we get this statement, we, we can really only apply this for a range of parameters where this GMC really exists. Okay, so this requires C to be on the real interval between zero and one. So let's now see what the consequence of applying this integral transform to the second form of the boundary bootstrap is. Well, what, what, the answer to that is that it's gonna be something associated to the conformal block around z equals one. Um, and so if I scroll back to that, it's gonna be the application of the integral transform against mu two, this expression on the right. Okay, so these are some very large formulas, so I won't write down the actual integral transform. But at the end of the day, what we're going to obtain is um, that on the left-hand side, we have the conformal block. And the integral transform on the right-hand side is gonna be something which is the, of the form found on the right-hand side of the fusion transformation of the spherical conformal block. Um, but the kernel will be somewhat different from the kernel found in the original physical statement of the fusion transformation. It's in particular gonna take the form uh, shown here, so it's some sort of integral transform over mu two of the product of boundary three point functions H uh, found in actually the paper of Guillaume with his collaborator uh, Tunan Zhu. Okay, so here we, once we get to this stage, we've obtained some type of fusion transformation. Here we've already related the conformal blocks around Z equals zero to the conformal blocks around Z equals one. Um, the only problem is that the fusion kernel we find is some quite complex formula. So to give you a sense, each of the boundary three-point functions, H, is a, a so-called hyperbolic Barnes integral, namely a certain integral against some pretty complex ratios of products of double sign functions. Okay, so the, what's left is for us to... Um, identify this kernel that we can prove something about, M bar, with the fusion kernel that's defined in the work of Ponceau and Teschner from the early 2000s. And so for this, we had to actually just directly prove an integral identity using a certain symmetry of these hyperbolic Barnes integrals. Okay, so if you go into the literature about hyperbolic Barnes integrals, you realize that they have a certain symmetry under the wild group of E7. And so we actually were able to explicitly find this you know, E7 symmetry that relates the two integrals to each other. Uh, this, this took a surprising amount of time to do actually. Uh, okay, so a consequence of that is that we're able to prove just the direct fusion transformation as stated in the previous work of Fonso and Teshner. Okay, so I now explained that by applying this integral transform against one of the boundary weights mu2, we're able to first associate the conformal block to this GMC expression over a more restricted range of z's, and secondly, prove the fusion transformation for uh, the conformal block um, as stated in previous work. And so now we need to show that the conformal block actually has these analytic properties via extension in Z, as well as in this parameter P. And so that's exactly going to follow um, in, in two stages. First, um, for almost every um, value of P, we know that the conformal block is analytic in Z and the unit disk. 
And by using this fusion transform, we're able to extend that property um, to all P and Z um, using, okay, I don't want to get into the details here, but just transferring properties of the analytic properties in P from the right-hand side where P only appears in the fusion kernel to the left-hand side. All right, so, so far I've told you sort of how we're able to get, get DMC expressions for the spherical conformal block, as well as uh, this fusion transform for the spherical conformal block. Um, but actually the starting point of our work here was not related to the uh, spherical blocks at all. We actually were previously working on the torus conformal blocks and we sort of realized that our techniques could apply to the spherical blocks. So let me tell you how this whole story can apply to the torus case as well. Okay, so in, in the torus case, we're gonna consider one point conformal blocks on the torus. So here, that for the setup, we need to choose a modular parameter which parameterizes the torus. And in the torus case, it's a bit less obvious how to associate that with the boundary Louisville theory. Um, so what we have to do is to associate the torus with the, the parallelogram with vertices between uh, the vertices at 0, 1, tau, and tau plus 1 as a standard. Uh, but the tricky thing is that to construct the torus whose boundary Louisville theory will be associated, sorry, the annulus whose boundary Louisville theory will be associated with this torus, we need to cut the torus um, in half. So what that means is that we're going to cut the torus at uh, tau over two and tau over two plus one. And we're going to treat that as an annulus whose vertical sides are identified. So that means the top and bottom edges of the annulus will be the bottom line of the torus as well as the midline of the torus. Um, so in this setting, we can define the one point torque block um, in two ways. First, there's a definition of it via the Virasor algebra which has this sort of series form that's very similar to uh, the one I presented earlier for the sphere. So roughly speaking, for the sphere, we're taking a matrix element of intertwiners of VRSO algebra representations. For the torus, we're going to take the same construction, but for a trace. Um, we are also able to define this via an annulus GFF by taking a similar construction to the sphere, but for a GFF on the annulus as defined above. Um, and, and so in the next couple slides, I'm going to show a very similar main theorem and proof strategy as for the work, our work on the sphere. Okay, so let me uh, first show you the probabilistic definition of the one point torus block from GMCs on the torus, okay, from GMCs on the torus. So first, we're going to take um, a Gaussian free field H sub tau on this annulus. And we're going to take the, um, this corrected observable to, be, to have the GMC against this annulus GFF plus this observable, which is the, actually the covariance of the annulus GFF. Um, so we're going to express the uh, torus conformal block in two ways. Our first expression um, comes from the boundary Louisville theory on the annulus. And it's this certain mixed moment of observables of the uh, annulus GFF, or interpreted differently, GMC is coming from the annulus GFF. Um, so what's important here is that we're going to be integrating this annulus GFF along two intervals. One is the interval from zero to one. So that's sort of the bottom line of our torus. And the second is the upper boundary of the annulus, uh, which was where we cut the torus to form the annulus. And you'll notice that uh, the, the moment exponents up here sort of add, they, they each have a dependence on P and the two dependencies are sort of opposite to each other. So the reason I wanted to highlight this is that we have a separate GMC expression for the one-point torus block. 
which came from our previous work, um, which is only in the case of the one-point torus block. So in that work, we found an expression for the one-point torus block explicitly in terms of a GMC constructed on the unit interval. Um, can, can, can I ask a question? Uh, and it's from us, where, 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 is the, where is the dependence on, 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 the, on, the, on, the, on the Z, on the location of the puncture of the torus? Yeah, so in, in, the, in the case of the torus, because um, we're only considering the one point block, um, although it's in principle a function of Z, there's no Z dependence on it. Yeah. So, yeah, so you'll observe on, in our previous formula, we, we have this GMC, which it turns out post hoc was the restriction of the annulus GMC to the interval zero one. Um, but actually, we didn't know that when we were uh, doing this work. We sort of just explicitly wrote down some GMC and proved in a pretty explicit non, and in a way that's not very conceptual, that this GMC expression satisfies all properties of conformal one. And so you'll notice that the two expressions look quite similar. Namely, the exponent here is minus alpha over gamma, and the exponent in the formula coming from the annulus. Uh, uh, Sorry, from the boundary Louisville theory on the annulus also contains this exponent minus alpha over gamma, and it almost looks like some of these uh, some of these uh, exponents are shifted from this line between zero and one to the line between tau over two and tau over two plus one. Um, so we're not fully sure why this is the case, since if the amount of the shift is not an integer, then obviously you cannot just shift certain contours. Um, but we were able to show that if this exponent um, minus 2i p over gamma is actually a natural number that you can explicitly do a contour shift and transform one of these formulas into another one of these formulas, into the other. Um, but in the general case, one thing we're not very sure about is what is the relation between these two GMC formulas. Okay, so that, given these formulas, let me show you our main results in the torus setting. So here, for some restricted range of parameters, we're able to, again, characterize the analytic properties of the one-point torus conformal block quite explicitly. So first, we're able to show that it converges um, in the full uh, disk for uh, in in this uh, modular parameter Q, and that it's meromorphic in this spectral parameter P. And secondly, we're able to show that it obeys what's called the Zamolotchkov recursion, namely that we know exactly the simple poles of the torque block in P, as well as the residue of the block at all of those poles. And finally, we have this GMC expression for the torus conformal block um, in terms of this annulus GFF. So here, I told you that the proof is supposed to run similarly to the proof in the sphere case. And that's, that's the case, but we need an additional input, which is the annulus boundary bootstrap, uh, which was proved by Baojun Wu. And I think that's work to appear. Okay, so finally, let me tell you about the analog to the fusion transform in this case. Okay, so um, in the torus block case, we, we don't have a monodromy between z equals zero and z equals one, because as mentioned earlier, this, the, the, the blocks actually don't have any dependence on this parameter z. Instead, what's gonna be relevant here is what's is a modular transform of the block expressing um, the transform form of the modular parameter Q. Okay, so we, we have this SL2Z action on the upper half plane, which also acts on these parameters Q. So we're going to consider the torus conformal block at the Q corresponding to our torus, as well as this Q tilde corresponding to the modular parameter minus one over tau. And what the modular transform says is simply that the space of torque blocks at some Q can be transformed to the space of torque blocks at Q tilde. 
Okay, so very explicitly, we can express the torque block at Q tilde as an integral against a certain modular kernel um, against this space of torque blocks at Q. Um, so one thing to note about this statement is that it's sort of a non-perturbative statement. Namely, it's not actually possible to expand both sides in Q or Q tilde simultaneously. Um, so in this case, this is exactly the torque analog of the fusion transform. And the modular kernel is gonna have a contour integral expression that's very similar to the expression of the fusion kernel. So again, it's some type of Barnes type integral, although in this setting, it's slightly simple. Um, and in this case, we're approving rigorously a statement which was previously shown at a physical level in two papers, one by Ponson and Tester, and a more recent sequence of papers by Nemkov. All right, so in this talk, we talked about how to do um, constructions of the two primitive types of conformal blocks um, via Louisville CFT. The first was the four point spherical block. And the second was the one point torus block. So, of course, the general theory of CFT says that you can construct sort of all primitive, ob all objects in CFT by applying these conformal bootstrap type constructions to these primitive conformal blocks and the primitive three point functions. Um, however, there's still some ingredient which, as a result of this, which is a general endpoint conformal block. So, in the future, we're interested in understanding how our constructions here can relate to the general endpoint case and what the expressions would be for modular transforms between these more general endpoint blocks. A second thing that we're pretty curious about and would love to hear any ideas anyone has is what can explain the connection between the two types of GNC expressions for conformal blocks that we found in the Taurus setting. Um, for example, in the spherical setting, there's a different type of guess that we can make for a GMC expression for the spherical block, which after two years of effort, we weren't able to prove. But that's the analog of our original uh, GMC expression for the torus block. So all of this is in a paper that's we're still polishing up. An early draft is on Guillaume's website. And thanks for uh, your attention. Okay, I'll just comment. Can you just, I just want to add one thing on the, go back to the slide with the, yeah, just to point out the two GMC expressions. This is the one we had in our previous work. It was the, is the P, well, the P parameter was inside the GMC integral. That is to say, uh, we don't know yet how they're, I don't know if everyone is inside some of this. Here. Yeah, in, in this case where there's some sort of integrality of parameter, we're able to explicitly show this by as a factor that's picked up in some sort of contour shifting operation. And the key is that in this integral case, uh, somehow like there's a finite number, like an integer number of these parameters that are picked up. But it, it's definitely something that does not make sense if if you don't have an integral, integral number of, integral dimension of contour search. All right. Just, just to basic question, uh, so the Liouville uh, CFT with C greater than 25, uh, does that correspond to a lattice model scaling limit of some sort or which, which uh, where should I expect to see it? Yeah. Or, or that's not the one that does uh, the C less than 25 corresponds to this one corresponds to the GMCs or yeah this one corresponds to the GMCs I, I don't believe there is so it's a a difference. Difference. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's some, 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 some unrelated question what 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 is the what exactly is the between these conform blocks available here and the those that appear in minute model models and 
for, for C less than one? Like, is, is there some precise relationship? Like, for example, are there some poles in the in the Q plane in which you can recover the minimal, minimal model conformal blocks? I think the minimal model conformal blocks have different central charges, so it may be yeah. Well, you, you can I mean you, you can you can imagine per, 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 per performing some kind of analytic continuation in Q. So if you if you put put Q Q Q Q can take a value which goes to a minimal model. I, I, I don't know. It's, it's probably some complex Q. Could you could you go to that point and see what happens? Yeah, what, what is the what is the relationship between the central charge and Q? Like Q uh, Q Q is one plus six. Or so central charge is one plus six Q squared. So my 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 does, does any of what you made sense? Does any of what you did make sense for imaginary Q? Uh, I don't think we can easily analytically continue in in, in capital Q here. Uh, so the GMC expressions in like uh, in in gamma they're not analytic. Yeah, the moments are not. So you have to keep gamma in uh, z zero. So so you can't. Where right, you need to take to take Q imaginary, you need to take gamma complex. Yeah, a lot of the work we had to do is picking the right parameters to even keep some of these GMC expressions well defined. So, sending so the properties in gamma or more generally capital Q is, is quite challenging. Uh, can I make a comment? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, yeah, so uh, I think uh, so. One thing we can also verify is this some logical recursion, right? At least in some cases. And uh, these some logical uh, recursion, they are only about the coefficients. And these uh, coefficients are just rational function of Q. So for these things, it uh, should also work for the minimum models, I think. And uh, also, if you assume these uh, fractional moments are actually integers, then they should also be holomorphic in gamma, right? So I think in some special cases, we might be able to say something about the minimum model blocks. Yeah, but I want to point out that that doesn't show that the final block is actually has these properties in game because these, yeah, yeah if you have serious coefficients that are rational functions or something, it doesn't mean your final things. So, so in, yeah. in actually, right. our so, yeah, so, so we cannot say it is a convergent for generic. Yeah, that's true. More questions. Okay, I guess let's thank you again.